Hi there everyone, welcome back to this Raspberry Pi series. We're into the second episode where, as promised, we will be discussing the anatomy of the Raspberry Pi circuit board. In this video, we're gonna take a closer look at several types of Raspberry Pi board and go through the function of each component to help you understand what each part does and why they're important. And this will really help us once we start thinking about building projects to deploy in the real world. A lot of the terms that we're going to use today in this video will be familiar to you because you have them already on your computers and laptops at home. So let's jump right in. So we'll start with the Raspberry Pi 3B, one of the most common large boards that you'll come across and the one I recommend that all beginners start with, especially because they're really easy to come by secondhand and they have a lot of built-in useful features that we'll talk about later. The first thing you'll probably notice is this big black square in the middle of the board, which is the CPU or central processing unit. This is essentially the brain of our Raspberry Pi, which reads and executes instructions. These might be mathematical calculations, which follow logical sequences, or decoding files in a way that allows us to view and read them. The more powerful a CPU is, the more sets of instructions it can follow at once, and the more quickly it can complete them. Raspberry Pis feature low power, low voltage CPUs. Now Raspberry Pis generally feature very low voltage CPUs, so they're not especially powerful, but they're still competent enough to run the sorts of tasks that make them useful for us. Now if you look very closely, you can see the lettering for Broadcom, which is the company that makes this particular chip. Now this black square also contains our GPU, or graphics processing unit which is used to draw out any images on screen, such as the desktop, a photo that we might want to view, or an animated graphic. Importantly, this chip also contains the RAM for our Pi, the random access memory. If the CPU is our brain, the RAM is our working or short-term memory. That is to say, the things that we're concentrating on right now. Any information in the RAM is immediately available to the CPU, so any programs or software that our Pi might be running as well as the data that those programs need to run, any information that's being stored in the RAM is available to the CPU extremely quickly. So any programs or software that our Pi is running and the data that those programs need to run, which means that our Pi can run those instructions at nearly full speed basically all the time. RAM, however, is what's called volatile memory, which means that it's only working as long as we supply power to it. If our Pi suddenly loses power, say we were to yank the cord suddenly, any information that's being stored in the RAM is instantly forgotten. This means that if our Pi is running a program, we suddenly cut the power. When we turn it back on, the Pi won't remember that it was ever running the program and all the data that it was using will be gone. Now, let's start moving on to a few features that you'll recognize. On the edge of the board here, we have four USB 2.0 ports, universal serial bus. These are obviously extremely common as an input-output device, so we can plug in things like memory sticks. I want to connect something like a computer mouse that I've got here. You all recognize these ports. And beyond these, we can also connect devices such as webcams, game controllers, hard drives, or even other Raspberry Pis if we decide to. So immediately next to our USB ports, we have an Ethernet port. This means we can use a cable to connect directly to the internet to guarantee us a more stable connection than Wi-Fi would allow. Then if we rotate around, I'm sure you'll recognize as well the 3.5 millimeter audio jack. This is the same as all our mobile phones used to have. So we can use this to connect headphones or speakers, for example. This port is special because it's also a composite video out. So with the right cable, we can actually use it to send video signals to screens or devices as well. Then hopping over for a second, we have the ubiquitous HDMI port, high definition multimedia interface. This port sends a digital video and audio signal to displays such as a computer monitor or a television. So obviously very easy to connect this to some sort of external display. Then moving across to this far edge, we have a micro USB port. This is actually what serves as our power supply to the Raspberry Pi board. If you look very, very closely, you can see it's actually labeled power, PWR. These connectors are thankfully extremely common and have been the standard for Android phone chargers until USB-C came along quite recently. Now the Pi itself only requires a five volt supply and about two amps of power to run. This makes them extremely low power devices. And even if you were to leave one running at full power, 24-7 for a year, it would add less than five pounds onto your energy bill. 
Now we just need to examine a few Pi specific components that you may not be so familiar with. Let's start with these two funny bracket style connectors. The first one here next to the HDMI port is a camera connector. So any Raspberry Pi compatible camera we could plug in here. And then this one over here is another type of display connector using a special type of ribbon cable. But we don't need to worry about that for the moment. Up here in the top left corner we have our Wi-Fi and Bluetooth radios. Do note that some models of Raspberry Pi do not come with onboard Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and you'll have to use dongles and adapters to get those and obviously you're using up your precious supply of USB ports. And this smaller of the two black squares is actually the controller for these USB ports and this Ethernet ports. So any of the data that comes through these lines is going to interface with that controller. So you're ready to have your minds blown. The Pi actually has things going on on the underside of the circuit board. There's only really one thing that we need to be concerned with on this side, and it's this, the micro SD card slot. This is where the Pi's operating system or OS runs from. An operating system is simply the software that acts as the connection or the messenger between the hardware of the board, that is all these chips and things we've talked about so far, and the software, that is the programs we actually want to run. You'll be familiar with things like Windows, Windows 10, Windows Vista, and Mac OS. These are all examples of operating systems, as well as iOS for Apple's mobile devices. There are loads and loads of these available for the Raspberry Pi, including Raspbian, Ubuntu, and some more specialized ones meant for Pis running a single purpose set of programs. This might be for gaming or music streaming, for example. Just for reference, here is a full-sized SD card. This is actually an adapter that converts micro SD to full size SD. That's micro SD, probably what a generous quarter of the size of SD, if that. They're absolutely tiny. So we load up our OS and simply slot the card in. They're keyed, so they can only go one way. And there we go. I'm sure many of you have the question, why do we bother with this? Why not just have some sort of onboard memory to run the OS? There's a couple of reasons. The first is that this allows us to move our code between Pi's extremely easily. So we can simply swap them between different Pi's. And the other advantage is that if something goes wrong, all our code stops working and our Pi doesn't want to play anymore, we can simply pop the card out very easily, go away and reset the card, slot it back in, and we're good to go again immediately within minutes. So flipping back over one more time, the last thing I want to talk about is this rack of pins here. These are GPIO pins or general purpose input output. And we can use these to do a very wide array of things. There are 40 of them, 20 along the top, 20 along the bottom. And as the name suggests, we can use them as either inputs or outputs, which is actually much more useful than you'd think. So not only can we send signals away from the Pi to send instructions to things like LEDs and motors, we can also receive information from devices such as switches and sensors. So now very quickly, I just want to compare a few different types of Raspberry Pi, and I've got a few to talk about here. Let's start with this one, the Raspberry Pi 4B, which is the very newest model on the market. Now just to bring my Pi 3B back to compare it, there's a few distinct features. So one of the key differences is the two USB 3.0 ports we've got on the Pi 4B here, whereas on the Pi 3, they're all USB 2.0. USB 3 can transmit data at significantly faster speeds than USB 2. So if we're building a project where we need long-term fast data movement, that might be relevant for us. You also might notice on the Pi 3 that we have that full-sized HDMI port, whereas on the Pi 4, we actually have two micro HDMI ports, and these are tiny, tiny connectors. But the Pi 4 can actually power two displays at full 4K resolution, but it does mean we're going to have to use an adapter like this one, which you can see then converts it to a full-size HDMI port. I do have one recommendation, however, with adapters, and that is to use these ones which have a short cable attachment, because in my experience, this type are much more prone to breaking. Any sort of force in this plane, if this is connected, will just snap it right off. Whereas with this kind of attachment, there's a bit more laxity in the connection. It's less likely to snap. Then the only last major difference is that we said on the Pi 3B that it was powered by micro USB, which was the most ubiquitous type of Android charger. The Pi 4 is instead powered by USB Type-C, which is this reversible standard connector. 
this is now becoming a much more commonplace standard for mobile phones. Of course, for everyone except Apple, because that would require them to get over themselves a little bit, which I'm not holding my breath on. But essentially, if you have a higher end Android smartphone made in the last few years, you'll probably have one of these kicking around. Then lastly, we have these little fellows. This is the Raspberry Pi Zero, and I've got two slightly different models here. The most obvious difference is the size, I would say probably about half the size of the full Pi, maybe slightly less. Now, these ones are much less powerful than the full size boards, but obviously their tiny size makes them much more suitable for projects that need to be compact. The Pi Zero again thankfully uses micro USB for power, it also uses micro USB for its standard USB supply. So most of the time, you end up building these daisy chains of adapters in order to give yourself a workable supply of USB ports. And just to be confusing, we were saying before that the Pi 3 uses full-size HDMI. The Pi Zeros actually use what's called mini HDMI, which is the middle ground between full-size HDMI and the micro HDMI that we saw before on the Pi 4B. So once again, we need yet another connector if we're going to use the Pi Zero. There's also one more important thing to note when it comes to the Pi Zero. There are two versions of it. The standard Pi Zero, which is available for usually less than $5, it's insanely cheap, does not come with onboard Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, so you're going to need to use USB dongles if you need those services. This model is the Pi Zero W, which is a bit more expensive. It's usually closer to $20 and it's difficult to come by most of the time. But the advantage with this board is that it does have onboard Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So if you're looking to pick up a Pi Zero, just think which services you're most likely to need. So now we understand the physical layout and anatomy of the Raspberry Pi board and the function of each component. In the next episode, we'll briefly discuss some of the options that exist to protect your Raspberry Pi from the elements and keep it running for years to come.